Welcome to the Breaking 90 podcast, where we talk about all things sustainable fat loss. We take people on 90-day journeys to creating fat loss forever. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoy the episode. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Breaking 90 podcast. I'm here today with my co-host, Jerrica Rydell, and we are two of the coaches of Breaking 90 Fitness. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoy today's episode. What's up, Jer? Not too much. Feels like, well, actually, I say it feels like, but it has been a while. Yeah. Yeah. We, uh, we haven't done a podcast in a while. So, um, it'll be, it'll be good to get back into a little rhythm here. Um, I know that you as the listeners haven't noticed it because we keep putting an episode out every week, but we went through a stint where we banked a bunch of episodes. So we didn't record any for a little while. Um, what's new? What's going on? Um, well, baseball season is fast, fast approaching. Nice, nice. Getting excited. So, That's that actually yeah. that'll roll nicely into my topic. So save save that for now. Um, okay. <laughs> I uh, I we we just have you ever gone to medieval times? No, no, okay. never. <laughs> so we just went to this with Emerson. Um, he was really excited because he loves like he, we took him to an Indiana Jones like play when we we're in Florida. Have you ever seen the one at Disney? Okay. No, uh, I might have, but I don't remember. There's like an Indiana Jones play with like explosions and gunfights and like fighting and, and they put on a really good performance and he loved it. He was on the edge of his seat the whole time. So we we're like, oh, medieval times will be really cool. Um, and it's so funny because like there's sword fights and jousting and um, you eat, they give you like chicken and you eat with your hands and it's like, <laughs> it's yeah it was pretty funny and, and all the sort like you could tell that everything's pretty staged like every time somebody yeah. gets knocked off their horse you could see them like jump and dive off of the horse um but he was like right on the edge of his seat and so he like, didn't know he so into it. they're swinging these swords at each other and he's like oh 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah so it's pretty cool it's uh i definitely wouldn't go without a small child present um but but for a kid it's a it's a pretty cool thing that's awesome well that's very cool sounds fun something different to do I guess yeah yeah it's good um okay so I I'm glad you brought up baseball because this is actually I think some people find this interesting is what uh let's let's just go through what our summer plans are and in a training priority and nutrition stance what what we're going for this year just to give people a bit of insight into into what we're doing so um what do you what do you have coming up this summer you're doing you're doing baseball what else yeah baseball takes a definitely the biggest time commitment and priority for most of my weekends as I play um, a lot down south kind of actually a lot of my tournaments are in Barry so um hopefully see a little bit but yeah so baseball well for those that are listening if you're a true softball slow pitch player you'll hate me for saying baseball, but it's just like a simple way to say it. It is slow pitch. <laughs> and, uh, and I have a few Spartans that I'd like to attend, um, which I'm thinking are July and October. And I'm doing my adventure race again, similar to oh, the cool. one we talked about last year, but this year it's in Algonquin, oh, cool. um, which is a totally new terrain for me, which will be fun. Um, as of right now, just a couple camping trips and, and that's kind of my, my main focus for the summer. Sweet. Um, which Spartan's the one in July you're looking at? Um, Ottawa? Yeah, I think it's Ottawa. I'm not mm-hmm. sure. Just I know that month is less busy for me, so I'm just going to pick one in Ottawa. There, there was a Montreal one and an Ottawa one. I can't remember. Oh, I would love to do Trump or the Trombone area. I don't think it's great at Trombone. No, I, but think, in the- I think that one's in June, actually. Mm. Yeah, we'll see. I got a. The cool thing was with my finishings last year, they gave me a bunch of free passes. Oh, sweet. Which, because Spartan is very expensive in my mind, like can be quite expensive if you're doing multiple. Yeah. Um, so now I get to kind of dabble in hopefully some different areas instead of the same one if yeah. they mountain. So that's my plan. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Um, okay. So my, the only thing I'm planning on competing in this summer is uh, Blue Mountain again. Um, other than that, it'll just be training for my own self and health and wellness. Awesome. 
Um, I, I looked at the one next month, but um, if I do it, it'll just be the 5K. So it'll, it'll just be more of like a test run than anything. Get out there and, and run around. Yeah. Yeah. Um, cool. So with, with slow pitch being the, the main priority for you or yeah, the main priority, is it going to, is most of your training going to go be going towards slow pitch would you say or is, is it most of your training going towards spartan or your adventure race um adventure race i would say not only because everything other than mountain biking is the only i need to add in for the adventure race but all my other training just complements the adventure race so um the, the interesting thing with slow pitch versus the spartan races is that with slow pitch, I'm definitely one of the primary base runners. So a lot of sprinting is involved oh. and I'm a fielder as well. So a lot of sprinting to the ball. So it's in my running program that I started up actually three weeks ago. Um, normally for Spartans, I would kind of start increasing my distance because I'm working my way to that 21 K, but I'm actually incorporating one day a week where I'm just solely doing sprints because it's insanely taxing on the body. And, oh, yeah. and I did my first set of sprints actually we had a practice in northern Ontario we're, we're still we still got a little bit of snow left on the ground so we're still not at the fields playing baseball so we've been practicing in a gymnasium mm. uh, at a local gym and uh, a school and so we've been doing practices in there and we I did my first sprint of the whole year I haven't sprinted probably since last October and we played pickle you know when you're you're running bases and you're stuck and you're trying to decide which base you're going to go to and they're throwing the ball back and forth um and I was sprinting as hard as I could. And I was sore for like five days. Yeah. Yeah. Sprinting is like, stimulus. is one of the most taxing movements for sure. Like there's a couple of lifts, like a couple of the Olympic lifts that are, that demand as much muscle output, but um, sprinting so athletics. People have no idea because people are like, oh, I've run fast before, but there's a massive difference between running fast and sprinting. Um. For anybody listening to this, if you're thinking about incorporating sprinting, uh, what's your advice, Jer? If somebody's listening to this, they're like, oh, I should start adding some sprinting into my training. Very similar to the advice I posted on the Instagram page regarding just summer running in general is just starting slow, starting slower than you think. Um, it just like it requires such a fast, intense, and that's baseball or softball or soccer. The sports where we go from zero to a hundred, that's where we see the most injuries and in like quad tears and hamstrings and um, even Achilles I've seen. So it takes a long time for the tissue to build that tolerance. So starting really slow and working your way up um, and not neglecting the little exercises. So like doing the calf raises or doing, you know, mm -hmm. little bunny hops and all the warm ups that require that that activation so that when we go to start and stop in the actual game or sport um at least they're prepared so my biggest advice is take time to build up to it and do the cool downs and the warm-ups there's i've seen so and i know you have to have seen so many injuries and people that just try to jump back in right if you used to sprint if you used to run if you used to play a sport it doesn't mean that you can just come off a winter of no exercise and jump right into it slow buildup is going to prevent a massive portion of the injuries that are coming to us. And especially with something as, as um, dynamic and intense as sprinting, start off way slower than you think you need to. <laughs> and this is interesting too, because pickleball has really gotten, I don't know if in Barry, but Sudbury is just, it's huge in Sudbury. And it's typically a sport that the older generations are getting into. And it requires that stop and start movement. And I'm seeing even in the kind of the health massage therapy world, I'm seeing a lot of injuries from pickleball because their bodies just aren't used to going stop, start, stop and go. And, uh, and now they're, they're doing that and pulling these yeah. muscles. And I'm like, ah, we got to build to this. Like, it's not just like golf. Well, even golf people hurt themselves, but it's not a sport where you can just go in cold. Yeah, yeah. And with anything you've got to build, but it's the high intensity movements require such a demand on the muscles and joints. Especially if you're going to try to play at a, at any sort of competitive level. Like if you're just hitting a ball back and forth, you're going to be fine. 
but right. if yeah. you're, going if you're really going to go for it. Yeah. If you're reaching for points and, and trying to win, like the, you're, you're doing things that your body hasn't done in a long time. I used to play competitive volleyball from a good chunk of my life. If I went and played in a volleyball tournament, I would be crippled right now. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It was just, it's our bodies adjust to what it's used to. And, um, and to get back to where we were, it takes a long time. So, cool. yeah. Okay. So, uh, so what's your training plan? What are you doing? So I'm currently running three days a week. Um, pretty light, very light. Cause I'm just getting back into it. I didn't run. If you've been listening to our podcast for a while, you know, that I used to be, I used to talk about loving winter running, which I still do. I just, this winter kind of got the best of me and didn't get as much running as I would have liked. So, uh, this year I'm kind of starting fresh is what I'm calling it. So my running program is very light, 20 minutes, um, little intervals, but 20 minutes or less right now, three days a week. And that will be ramping up to my first 12 K race, a trail race, kind of like a prep race. I think it's that one's in June, nice. the end of May or early June. So my program should get me to that 12 K race by then, which is awesome. And then I'm currently strength training wise, um, about four days, so a little bit lighter than I used to be. I used to train pretty heavily at that five, six days per week. So I'm only hitting about four. Um, I'm not sure when the podcast came out in order, but on the last podcast with Kelly that I did, I talked told everyone that I got a dog. So <laughs> that's been a lifestyle adjustment for me in terms of just, you know, a puppy you can't leave alone very long. Yeah. So normally I do attend a local gym and, you know, I, I devote a big chunk of my time there. And so now it's been just getting out for a 20 minute run while he's napping. <laughs> I feel like a parent, right? Yeah. while he's napping or bringing my dumbbells in the living room and I'm doing random exercises just to kind of maintain where I'm currently at. So there's no real big strength, no big program that I'm completely following at the moment, which has kind of been refreshing to be honest. Cool. I'm like the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> I've been, I've been for a while now, just been maintaining my basics, like always squatting, deadlifting, mm -hmm bench pressing chin-ups overhead press those are the ones that like I've never let slide I just even if I only have a half hour I'll go in and pick two of the big lifts and do them awesome um but now I'm starting to get back into like a normal program a normal set program so um yeah I think there's power in both sometimes just to go through that that maintenance phase that lets your mind rest oh, yeah those those big pushing phases um I'm I'm sounds similar to what you're trying to do i'm trying to just get out running three times a week um i do have a bike that i use if it, i'm like a bit of a fair weather runner so if i don't want to get outside <laughs> i'll bike right now but as the season starts to change i'll force myself to do a lot more runs because i know i need that and then um i'm gonna start with three days of training per week which i'll bump up to four maybe five five hasn't really fit my lifestyle in a while now so um, we'll see. I, I, my plan is to get up to four and just see how that feels. Four days of training a week, strength training per week. Um, I felt my best for sure a long time ago when I was training five or six days a week, but I don't think that fits most people's lifestyles. Um, and I don't think you need that for the average goal either. So if you're listening to this and you can strength train two or three days a week, you can make progress. Don't, don't let that all or nothing mentality get to you where it's like, I have to do four or five or six. We've, we've had tons. I've made progress training two or three times a week. Um, and then just walking on top of that. So a lot of my, a lot of my cardiovascular training right now, is super, super low intensity, just getting my kilometers up because I've only been biking for cardio in the winter. So now just putting in kilometers on the streets so that um, my body has a chance to adapt before before I would do any speed work and um, long distances. So like the longest distance I've done so far this year is 5K. Do you set out for a distance or do you set out for time? I'm just curious Both. how you run yours. Yeah, I switch. So, so we've talked about this a bit in the past, but I, I still try to follow the model that um, there's tempo runs, long, slow, long, slow runs. And then um, I haven't started including much interval work yet, a little bit on the treadmill, but just some speed work. But I haven't done much interval yet because I'm just trying to create a base. And then recovery runs, I'm not as worried about either because I'm not really taxing my body enough to need recovery runs yet. Um, but if if you're listening to this and you're going to be adding in a lot of volume throughout the year, you have to build in those recovery runs, those those low and slow 
runs not crazy long distances like that allows your body to recover better um so right now most of my most of my work is either long slow where i'm going for distance or um picking a specific distance and and going for a tempo if i'm feeling really good um maybe trying to pr for the year which isn't that hard because i haven't been out for that many runs yet this year or if i'm like if i'm sore tight then i i just go for somewhere between 80 and 100 percent of my last run at that distance that's a good way to do it actually I like that yeah, yeah. I don't have like I don't have massive fitness goals and I think most people listening to this can relate our, most of our goals are to live longer better healthier lives that's me too I want to be able to do things like Spartan but I'm not trying to come first I'm trying to I'm trying to better myself I'm trying to do a little better than I did last year I want to con- continue to be able to keep up with Emerson as he gets older and more athletic and I want to always be able to do these things I don't want there to be things that I'm like nah, I couldn't do that anymore so that's, that's kind of where my goals lie, which isn't a really like, it's a hard to measure thing, right? It's not like I, it's not like a set tangible outcome. So a lot of it, um, a lot of that longevity and training comes from not always trying to crush yourself. I don't always need to PR going out and doing a run at the same pace I did it last week, or a slightly slower pace than I did last week, like that's going to increase my longevity as a runner. And I think it's funny you say the word longevity because that's been such like a hot topic. I don't know if in your social media world, but um, it's what I'm seeing all over is kind of like what can increase that. And and it's funny when you say that because longevity is in my mind is not just lifespan, right? It's not just living longer. It's also having a better quality life on top of that. So you kind of tied both of those in there. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. I've been thinking about that a lot lately. Um, as, as, as I set my goals and, and reflect on where I want to be six months from now, a year from now, five years from now, I think about all of that. Um, so let's, let's flip this a little bit. So changing anything from a nutrition standpoint leading into summer, or what, what's that looking like for you? Definitely. Like I mentioned, um, a lot of my, my routine has kind of been a little bit different the last four to six weeks. So, um, with that routine, change has been a big drop in water intake um my regular protein consumption has also dropped as well so you know prioritizing things that were something i never even questioned in the past um so i've kind of had a an, a chance to experience kind of what a lot of our listeners have experienced on a regular basis so um just going back to the basics right now as we approach kind of may june and then once i can dial that in and create those good health habits once again um, I'll be doing a little bit more performance nutrition leading up to some of the bigger Spartans. Um, so just a little bit more diligent tracking. I'm loosely kind of just keeping um, an eye on making sure that I'm consuming protein with every meal, using my favorite water bottle, just making sure I'm getting three of those in. So just very loosely eyeballing and just um, kind of creating more of a positive relationship with all these habits again, like I mentioned, as it's been a little while since I've kind of hit my goals. So once I have that in place, yeah, I'll have some more specific numbers, which I'm kind of excited. And you know, that I like to dive into more detailed things and have a lot more structure in my life. So I'm excited to see what that brings. And I've never really had, you know, a nutrition coach accountability. And I'm using a, I guess I would say a friend, but a coach that I know locally. So just to communicate with, it's just nice to have that conversation um, externally. For sure. Every, every, like everybody who's listened to this podcast has heard me talk about it. I've hired tons of coaches for myself. There's nothing, I've never had a coach teach me something where I'm like, oh, I, I didn't know that. It's not about knowledge. It's about accountability, right? Like there's a, the, the knowledge gap is almost never what's holding somebody back from success. You and I have been in this industry a long time. We know what we need to do, but sometimes we need that extra accountability too. So I get that. I've, I'm, I've, I'll probably end up hiring a coach for the summer too um it just takes like the the brain work out of it as well as because that's is what we do for a living right um I know I can write a program that I would love but I'd also write a program that would probably omit some of the exercises that I hate doing and and forget to do so uh, it's just nice to have someone else and you just put the work in and you can kind of close the book on that and not to think about um you can actually do your job versus um spend time on yourself for mindless stuff that I don't need to be doing it's completely different training yourself it is like look at the look at the best athletes in the world they have like 12 different coaches on their team (laughs) right 
and I'm the type of person I'm sure almost all of us are and which is why we hire coaches that would be like five sets of squats uh the dog's whining okay four sets of squats like so easily yeah. able to convince myself mm-hmm. not to um so when you have someone checking in like hey why didn't you or you know nice job just anything knowing that they're going to be looking at it that's all I need yeah that's all we it, all need really it, that goes through different phases for people too. Like there's times of my life where I'm like, I wouldn't mm-hmm. hire a coach right now because I know I wouldn't be a good client. I don't, right. I'm not driven for it. I'm, I'm basically in a maintenance phase right now. I'm not looking to push anything. It's not going to be, I don't need a coach for that. And it's not going to be exciting. And, uh, and then, then like now, for instance, when I'm switching gears and I'm starting to train a little bit more specifically, like, yeah, okay, let's, let's show up and let's have somebody hold me accountable. So I get that. Um, one thing I was doing with my nutrition that that's been helping just from a maintenance standpoint is just forcing myself to eat vegetables with every meal. And then I have a fruit after every meal. I like it a lot because it's like, it's just like a, a little trick that helps for so many different reasons. You, you eat the vegetable with the meal, which stops you from just randomly eating shit food because you're like, well, I don't want to pair this shit food with a piece of broccoli. So you're, you actually have to put some thought into what you're going to eat because you're like, oh, no, I have to eat a vegetable with the meal. And then afterwards, you have the fruit, which keeps you full longer. But also you're keeping that in mind. You're like, I, I need to keep some room for that piece of fruit. So you're not eating till you're stuffed mm-hmm. anymore because you're like, I still have to have a banana after this or whatever. Um, so it's just like, it's just an easy little trick that, I, that I've been using through this last maintenance phase to not have to like really seriously track my nutrition, but it, it's, it's held me accountable to a certain extent. Absolutely. Just make sure you're getting in the right good quality nutrients as well. Yeah. yeah. I like and that. You, I like the fruit idea. That's cool. Yeah. You don't feel deprived either. You, you still feel like you can eat a lot well, of food. And for me, like fruit is like most people, but fruit is like so sweet to me. It's Mm. like eating candy and I'm also a candy person, but so, and I always need something sweet after I eat. Typically it's like, I do crave chocolate more than let's say raspberries, but I used to actually put little dark chocolate chip it in my raspberries and push them in there and then I'd eat them. Um, But I think that'd be a cool way to kind of still satisfy that sweet tooth, but kind of steer you away from the really sugary stuff yeah and like I, I haven't been saying no to anything so I'd still have the chocolate but I would just finish the meal right. with fruit so I'd have the fruit. chocolate and then I'd still have to leave room for the piece of fruit that's cool the yeah, strawberry thing fun. remind or the the raspberry thing reminded me of Emerson he's like do we have any of those strawberries dad I was like uh no we don't have any strawberries what what are those ones called that you can put on the ends of your fingers he says it's like oh, no, <laughs> those are those are raspberries, the raspberries. <laughs> oh that's cute <laughs> Because um, he puts them on like and then yeah. eats them. Yeah. Oh, that's cute. Yeah. <laughs> he loves fruit berries specifically. Um, okay, yeah, that, that's all I really wanted to go over. I think it's interesting just for people to hear what our plans are and what we're focusing on, just to just to kind of like normalize different different approaches and to hear that we're not training seven times a week and eating only broccoli and chicken, right? It's um, so true. And and to know, I think often, you know people see recently I posted like a really heavy clean I think I used as a as a real one and they see the highlights and it's just that reminder right that they see all the oh Jerica must train or Alex must train like you said seven days a week and only lift heavy it's like no actually I've been since six weeks and I think I've actually lifted anything three times right. like that is in the last 10 years I've never went this long in my life of not having a consistent workout routine um, and I did my first workout on Wednesday the first one in at least three weeks in the gym and I still can't walk like so I can relate to everyone that's posting like damn you coach Jared putting uh making me this sore like you know we are human too and we don't do these superhuman type programs and we're not perfect so yeah I think this was a good idea to just bring to light cool um the last thing I'm going to leave you guys with, if you, if you go into our Forever Fit, Forever Strong Facebook group, you'll see a, video, a longer video I shot about this, but the idea of compound interest in health and fitness, something I've been thinking about a lot. So the stuff that we can apply now that will have a massive impact five years from now, this is a really interesting way to reframe your habits and decisions because we we often we often look for that immediate that immediate change, the things that are going to have an impact in the next day, week, month. But but if we start saying, I don't really care what impact it has now, I'm doing this for the long run, 
it makes this so much easier. So, so the example, I'll just give one example. I won't keep, keep it too long here. Um, the example I gave was the, an average Starbucks drink has about 260 calories in it. If we cut that, if we have that drink five days a week on the way to work, so you have a five days a week, I cut out the weekends and you cut that drink out five days of the week. That means in one week, you'll have lost the calorie equivalent to a third of a pound. Not really that much. You're probably not even going to notice it on the scale. It's it's like you might start feeling a little bit different or better. Or you might start noticing some change, but probably not. That's why most people get discouraged. They're going to stop. They're not going to, they're like, oh, well, I missed my drink. I'm going to just go back to it because I didn't notice a great change. Now, the same thing, you, you decide, no, I'm going to keep pushing. After a month now of that, you've lost a pound and a half. Still, probably you might not even notice a pound and a half on the scale because of menstrual cycle or um, water retention or an injury, you, whatever. You might not even notice that pound and a half on the scale yet, but it's starting to get there. It's starting to get to the place where, where you're going to notice it. And that's, that's once again, where most people are like, ah, oh, screw this. I miss my Starbucks. So then the, the bigger picture now, over a year of this habit, cutting this drink out, we've lost 19 pounds. 19 pounds just from cutting out a drink. Like we haven't really asked you to change your life at all. You've cut out a drink that you had five days a week on the way to work. That's huge. 19 pounds in a year, five years from now, that's close to a hundred pounds, right? Obviously our metabolic rate is going to change. We're going to burn a little bit more or less, but just from cutting out a drink now for five years, it could lose a hundred pounds. Like that's that's mind blowing. So my challenge is just for people to think of the small things you could do. 10 minutes of reading, getting to bed five minutes earlier, going for a 10 minute walk after dinner. These things that have zero impact on a day to day basis, a little bit of impact on a week to week basis, a bigger impact on a month to month and a massive impact over five years. These are the habits you need to be changing in your life. It's not going to be the quick fix that does it for you. That's awesome. Um, I'm going to make this podcast longer because I'm going to touch on that for a second. Okay. <laughs> okay. So last last night we held a legacy call. So this is for our um, our members that have been with us three months or longer. We dive into deeper topics. They get a little more access to these deeper conversations. Anyway, so I dug into um, whole foods slash minimally processed foods versus highly processed foods. And in the conversation, it was about, um, you know, we talk about eating both of these and, and they both have a place, you know, sometimes having craft dinner has a place, whether it's for our brains or for convenience or whatever. But someone we were talking about, you know, we can lose fat still by eating, you know, all the highly processed foods that we want, as long as we're within that kind of deficit. And we dug into someone, there was a study down where someone ate McDonald's for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and, and they still saw a fat loss. And it was like, my point was this kind of compound interesting, which I didn't use that term, but it was for those that just incorporated whole, more whole foods into their diet. And there was a study done and I don't remember exactly how much, much more whole foods they incorporated. Um, it puts you at a lower risk for type two diabetes, cancers, you know, the list goes on. There was like four things I rhymed off and just that alone, especially if you have any of these genetic things that run in the family, just thinking about adding in one to two more pieces of whole foods into your diet a day. Although, you know, that might not be something you enjoy. You have to kind of remember that long game. I um, mean, you might want to be able to live longer for your family, be around for your grandkids, you know, getting on the floor and moving around, trying to keep healthier joints. There's always that like deeper, further down the road reason um, and why we should be kind of compounding these small things now. And that's kind of what made me think about um, what we talked about last night. Yeah, and it all leads into other things too. I mean, so that person, that person who cuts out their Starbucks drink or who adds in a 10 minute walk, like, okay, so if they did it consistently over a year, they could lose 19 pounds. But the the decisions that they're making and what they're choosing to do instead of that also compounds. Now I'm choosing right. to make some other healthier choices. Now I'm having better conversation. Now I'm reading that book and I'm learning something like it spirals and it, it, our whole, our whole health grows as a result of making these small choices now that feel very, very insignificant. One of the really cool kind of things I find that happens to people when they start 
you know, making small decisions like the Starbucks drink and then changing their conversation more around health and wellness, then you start actually hanging around with like-minded people. Just, you know, by chance, you just start noticing because your conversations, you want it to be around health, wellness, fitness, nutrition, things that are bringing you joy. Then you start hanging around with these people that also feel that way. It's like your whole life starts changing positively. Like it's, it's such a small little thing that can really affect such a big part in your life. Pretty yeah. Cool. We should stop because we could, uh, we could, probably, <laughs> we could probably make a whole nother episode about this. Yeah. Right. Anyway, anyway. <laughs> we'll call it compound and dress. All <laughs> right. Tuned. Thanks for listening guys. Hope you enjoyed wherever you're listening right now, take a screenshot, share it to Instagram and tag us so that we could get more listeners like you. Have a great day. Mm-hmm.